June, thank you so much for taking the time to be on this show. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. And it's so nice to meet you. Second time. Um, before we get into painting, I really want to ask more about your formative years in Australia. Um, looking back now, how important were those years in Australia in the context of your life? Uh, I suppose they were more important than I realized because, of course, it happened to me. Um, it was um, a slightly unconventional childhood, to say the least. My parents were musicians in theatre and... Um, also the fact that they split when I was about six. So my mother uh, brought up my brother and myself. And uh, she was in the theater, I mean, she was amazing. She was the, uh, she belonged to the big entrepreneurs in Australia who dealt with all the ballet companies and the opera companies and the musical comedy and Gilbert and Sullivan and review, whatever came through. And she did all the rehearsals and she was back for the show at night. So there was a lot of time I didn't see her. Um, so I happened to be able to draw. Um, don't ask me how it started, child draws, you know. And that was an escape. Filled my time drawing. Um, and of course that grew, but I obviously had a, a particular gift. I mean, we have a particular gift and there are other aspects of, of an art that um, you have to catch up with. I happen to have the gift for getting a likeness. I never had to think about that. And... Um, so I was exposed, of course, to a, a lot of music of all sorts as a child. And the theatre background. I was a sort of backstage kid, if you like. Um, I used to go and meet my mother at the theatre after school. But um, fitting in with the other children was not difficult. It was diff different, different. I can only look back, of course, and, and assess that at the time. I, I didn't understand that. But always drawing, always drawing. Hours and hours by myself, happily drawing. My mother used to provide me with the drawing books and the drawing pencils and leave me to it. You mentioned the word escape, escapism, in relation to drawing. What were you escaping from? Oh, um, I think I mean that uh, the other hours I wouldn't have known what to do with, that was where I went, to a drawing book. Did you try to fit in with the other kids? I suppose I did in my way, of course. It wasn't that I wasn't without friends. Um, I had a particularly beloved friend at school who went through a lot of my life, you know. Um, I didn't. I didn't appreciate this. It was just different. And by the time I was 12, there was no question of what I would do. I was even getting publicity when I was about 12. If you can't that for anything... Did you have many friends who were artists like yourself? No. Uh, that is something that has um, been also a difference, if you like, in my life. Um, even uh, latterly, uh, at meetings and so on, society meetings, art society meetings. You know, I, I ended up with four kids. And um, when they went off to the pub after the meeting or something, of course, uh, it really wasn't convenient for me to go. 
So I've never, amongst my friends, had a lot of musician friends. I've known a lot. Heaven knows I've painted a lot. But um, I think most of my friends... Oh, and also, you see, my theatre background. I wafted into the theatre for a few years. While I was doing portraits, I mean, uh, I needn't say any more than just um, portraiture has gone through whatever else I have done. It's it's always been there. I've always been doing it. So, yes, I had about four years kicking up my heels in the theatre, having a very good time. Even did a West End show. And sang with bands. Yes, that's come out of the archives. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, lots lots of fun things. Just Just different. Yeah. It was an event, eventful childhood. A lot of it was not. A lot of it was, looking back, boredom. Boredom. But nevertheless, a lot of fascinating things have happened. You mentioned singing. Did the idea of becoming a singer ever cross your mind? No, I wafted into that. I apparently had a bit of a voice and uh, could sing the, the ballads of the time, you know, mm. worked with bands and um, just sporadically, not not all that much has happened. Radio shows, you know, when I was doing theatre stuff, radio shows and um, straight theatre, straight theatre and review. I did a couple of reviews and straight acting, and um, yes, I have an anecdote. Do you want an anecdote? Yes, please. I went for an audition for a famous musical called Me and My Girl, right, which was the last time that the fabulous Lupino Lane did his show, his, his Me and My Girl which he'd done over the years many, many times. And he, known as Nip, he took the audition. So I went along for the audition. He said, OK, go ahead. So I, I did my something from Annie Get Your Gun. I you know, sang my bit. And he said, can you sing Me and My Girl? So I went straight into the, the bells are ringing for me and my girl. You probably know that one. He looked at me. He said... Um, do you know the other me and my girl? I'd sung the wrong me and my girl for the audition for his show, <laughs> Me and My Girl. So anyway, he he giggled a bit and he said, somebody fresh to the show and you're in. I got the job. Wow. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Surprising So result. you see, I wafted into it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Thank you. <laughs> Were there many paintings in the house when you were growing up in your parents home paintings no yes. no uh, virtually none at all really um music law you know in in various forms um no that's the first time i've thought of that i suppose a couple of my things were plonked on the wall <laughs> At the time, yes. We moved quite a lot because mum was on tour quite a lot. And um, oh, for various reasons, you know, that's another story. Mm. Yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was 1943 that you collaborated with your mother in a book of poetry. The tale is familiar. Oh, good God, where did you dredge that up from? Um, yes, I did some illustrations. She yes. well, she was mad about dogs. She had yes. masses of stray dogs over a period of time of all shapes and sizes. And uh, she wrote a book about them, and I illustrated it. Yes. What was it like working with your mother? Oh, project. I wasn't working with her. I just, I just did the illustrations, and they were put in the book. Hmm. Yes, 
we didn't, there was nothing to collaborate on, you know, she'd done those stories, yes. I probably did sketches of the dog we had at the time. Were you close with your mother? Oh, yes, Very yes, close. yes. Um, complicated relationship. That's another big story, yes. But, um, yes, yes, she was quite a girl, <laughs> quite a girl. What's and an amazing musician, pianist. She could transpose at sight. Wow. Well, it doesn't make you a musician any more than getting a, having a, um, a talent for getting a likeness doesn't make you an artist. There are too many other facets to deal with. But anyhow, that's, she could do that. And she was a good pianist. What did she play? Oh, anything. Anything. She had to, with all the things she came across in her work. I mean, when it came to the solo part and Petrushka, Mum did it. And that's not easy, as you well know. Mm -hmm. What's the most prominent memory that you have of your parents? Uh, my father, I hardly have any memory of at all, very, very little, and heaven knows how accurate that is. Um, my mother, complicated, brilliant, emotional, um, funny, amazing woman, yes. Do you see... Who did what she could and worked very hard. Yeah. Not, not a... Not an easy story. Do you see any parts of her in you? Oh, I went past the mirror the other day and I thought, my God, that looks like my mother. <laughs> 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 so if I could see it, I'm sure others can. <laughs> Is that positive or negative? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I want to touch back on what you said about being able to transpose doesn't make you a musician. Um, being able to achieve a likeness in paintings mm -hmm. doesn't make you an artist. Um, besides that, what makes you an artist? Besides likeness, what other factors make you? Oh, Anthony, an there are so many. Look, so many. Um, you take your right hand and there are at least five things that you deal with technically, painting-wise. Take the other hand, five things you deal with portrait-wise. And the clever trick, if you can, is to blend all these aspects without cancelling out one of the others. You're sure to have a a forte for something. I mean, we all know um, uh, portrait painters who do beautiful paintings, but God help you with the likeness. On the other hand, you get some photographic portraits exactly like the person, and it's a bad painting. And of course, I mean, you set up, you set up a um, a room full of twenty students, twenty painters. Put it that way. You get 20 answers. The variation, the fine points. Massive. Wide variety. As I think probably you can say that of practically any art. What are those five things? <laughs> well... I mean, uh, which on the on the on the uh, technical side? I mean, you've got your composition, you've got your design. If you, if this is only me saying it. Mm -hmm. This is my view. Mm -hmm. If you don't get your design right, you might as well forget the whole thing. Your balances, your um, your darks, your lights, your lines, your directions. Um, uh, that's that's one thing, and that is not just in your darks and lights, but then your color, your color age. Uh, I mean, you you know, like Mondrian, um, you can do cubes and things in your painting, 
and you've got big areas of blue or orange or something. And let's not say orange, blue and green, say. And it overbalances. You, you put a mental nail in the middle of the painting and you see if it swings one way or the other. Your blue and green are tipping it over to the left. You put one spot of red in the right place and it balances up. Make it larger and it starts to balance the other way. It's so, to me, it's so fine. It's so important. It, um, it's like uh, chewing something bitter if it's, if it's wrong, if, if, if it overbalances when I'm doing it, yes. If it overbalances. I love the feel of a design going through. That's one, that's one. Then you've got your form, and then you've got your color balance. You've got your tonal balances. Then, of course, you go into the, into the portrait side. And what are you saying? What has dictated your directions and your, your balances? Is the person in front of you? What, what is their body language? And can you manipulate something because that statement about that person is a, a given, you can't avoid it? That dictates something to you. So you've got the beginning of a painting that is different from the last one because of that one. I mean, I remember doing a painting with about, um, I think there were about eight or nine men in it. It was an academic um, uh, committee. And they all came in and, and stood there waiting for me to tell them what to do. And I thought, good God, what did I do with them? So I said, would you all sit, please? They all sat down in a row and they all sat differently. Some with cross legs like you have, some leaning forward, some with their hands, um, arms crossed and so on, etc. And it all made a design throughout. So they're all in a row, but it's all it's all designed. It was fascinating. But it, it made the design I wanted, but it also said something about each person individually. Because that's what they did. That's what they were. They gave that to me. Then I had to take it further. How did you take it further? Oh, uh, well, design within design. I mean, then you've got your balances of your colors and your darks and your lights and your angles. Um, I mean, it might be a coat lapel. It might be a where a foot is. You call it a, a, a lapel and a foot. I call it a shape. Hmm. In other words, you're do. I mean, this is me again, just the way I work it. You're doing a portrait, but it is a bunch of shapes and colors and directions. Plus the person and their character and, and the things they say in their body language, in their hands, in their shoulders, in the tilt of the head, or not, as the case may be. Do you find you can read body language quite easily? Um, apparently I'm not bad at that. Yes. Yes, I can, actually. I've had it borne out many a time. <laughs> Without pinning it down, I mean, I know that if I get smug about anything, I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the gods are watching me, gotcha. You know? <laughs> but, uh, yes. And also, if somebody I haven't met before comes into the room for um, a portrait, I've got to assess them very fast. Um, there's a certain way. Do you want all this technical stuff? Sure. All right. Um, there's a way of doing the first session. You're, you, have to, you, you have to think fast. You have to observe fast. But also, I mean, obviously, you've had a lot of experience with this, so you ought to be getting things right. But nevertheless, you're leaving something open because you don't know that person, and who are you to assume? 
Um, so you can do your first session that leaves a lot open. And by the time you've had a couple of hours with them, and also they pose carefully to start with, self-consciously, of course they do. But after in the break, they drop the pose, and you think, ah, that's it, they've done it. And they've just moved their shoulder or their head a certain way, and it's relaxed. And it just gives you something about them and the line and you're off. It begins to make sense to you. And it's exciting. Something clicks. So the second session, of course, you, you then then you're you're beginning to fix it. Hmm. You can bully them into the position they didn't <laughs> know they could, they took. Have any of your subjects become good friends after you painted them? Yes. They have. Yes, I've got some wonderful chumpers through painting. And people, um, I've got a lot of people I perhaps don't see for two years, but it's it's real hug time when we see each other again, you know. Because um, how often do you see your best friends? Well, I mean, in, in this busy world, you know, from time to time, they're your beloveds, but with the painting, you're going to... Uh, over possibly quite a short period of time, say two or three months, you're going to see them half a dozen times for two hours each. And you're going to have a special time with them in as much as if you if you go to lunch with a friend, you, you're obliged to talk to each other. But if you're painting them, you can have long, comfortable silences while you just get on with work. Or you can have conversations. And because it's an intimate situation, um, it's amazing what you find, you learn about them, where the conversation goes. And, and a bond that you, you've worked together. You just haven't had a social. You've worked together. This grows. And the, there are certain stages. There's the self-conscious first one. There's the second one, which is fine. Third one, they're probably getting bored to tears. You know, oh God, not again. And then the fourth one, they're working with you because, of course, they can see something really happening on the canvas by then as well. And they've they've got into the into the um, can't think of the right word the motion of it. And they're with you, you know. Yes. I've got some lovely friends from painting. And amazing, different friends. Very, very lucky. It's an extraordinary profession. Any walk of life you can think of, almost. Why not? Would you say painting someone is a better bonding moment than having a lunch with someone? Uh, no, um, initially it can be stronger. Yes, of course it can be stronger because it's it might well have gone into areas over the relaxed two hours mm -hmm. than the social scene. Yes, can easily mm. and often has. Why portraiture? Is it because you just could... Get the likeness of. I can't tell you it. Um, that was established before I even thought about it. It was always live things I wanted to draw mm. when I was, you know, before I did went to painting. Animals, animals as well, and people it was always people. And I think also certain influence um, the the personality um, awareness through theatre, through my mother and theatre. There was a lot of, uh, well, theatrical, who people were, mm -hmm. what they did, not just the man on the street. That came later, yeah. What do you think is the most difficult thing to capture in a face? 
Um, I haven't got an answer to that one. Um, it sounds pretty pompous. I, I don't yeah. have a difficulty with any... Uh, it's just um, an instinct. Um, I, I just sort of know what the muscles are doing, what makes an expression. I, I don't ask me. I, I can't <laughs> tell you. I mean, I know what I'm doing when I'm painting and why. Because, I mean, you you physically got to put a piece of paint on the canvas. Mm -hmm. But I know where it's going. There's an intuition. I, call it what you will. <laughs> Has self-portraits ever interested you? Have you done any self-portraits? Oh, I, I, we had to at one stage. Um, the um, I belong to various um, art societies, and one of them is the Royal Society of Portrait Painters. And they had a special exhibition one year of self-portraits, so I jolly well had to. So yes, but I'm I'm I wouldn't choose me as a subject. Um, in any case, but apart from that, I don't know what my body language is. Also, I'm seeing myself back to front in the mirror. So, not madly interested in that. Has anyone ever offered to paint you? Um, a, a couple of um, artists, we've, we've had fun, we've painted each other, yes. Oh yes, had great fun with one artist. Um, we painted each other simultaneously. Oh, right. Yes, he painted me while I was painting him, <laughs> and um, I'm also in the mirror behind him. So we had sort of multiple. We had great fun doing this, and we hung them in the same exhibition next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound fun. Ken painting June painting Ken, you know. <laughs> 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 just, I just want to backtrack slightly um, to your early career. In around 1950, you worked for Holton Press, is that correct? Oh, gosh, yes. 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 And five years in that role, you first, after five years, you painted the first royal portrait, is that correct? I Don't ask me years, <laughs> Anthony. I haven't a clue. I've got... No idea of time spans. Sure. They? Yes, but, they get away from me. Is that so? Yes. Really? Uh, apparently, a, according to, yes, to this, just five years. I must come back to you and get all the information <laughs> about my life. <laughs> I, I'm i very curious as to what happened in those five years. Oh, I would have been in my Earl's Court bed sit with the gas ring. I definitely was, and um, that was the thing. Now, talking about likeness, now, the thing that got me that job was the fact that I could reproduce all the characters in all the different positions with likeness. I'm, I'm, I mean, don't ask me what the technique was like, but that I could do, and, of course, that was an essential for illustrated strips and uh, so I did that for for several years um, really tough job to start with um, why oh, is that? it was 12 hours a day you know seven days a week but then of course you got used to it and the dear man who uh, ran the magazine at the time saw me through the first six weeks until the printings came out and I could see what the uh, technical stuff was doing when it was printed. Um, and so, of course, you ended up being able to do it in a couple of days per week. Experience, experience, yes. And portraits in the meantime, as always, as always. You know, um, a sniffle and going to the doctor for... Um, a cough mixture or something or other. I certainly couldn't pay for it before the illustration drop. And so I did a port uh, sketches of his sons for him. 
for payment. Barter system, I'm all for it. Wow, was was you know, those days and oh, mad jobs. <laughs> um, industrial fair at Olympia, and um, I was well paid for two weeks, and I was advertising ballerina cigarette lighters, and I had to walk around the the uh, great stadium, whatever you like to call it, mm -hmm. dressed up in a tutu with cigarette lighters stitched onto my tutu. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> for two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> but I got well paid. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I got the Halton Press job, and I could, I could actually, yes, go to Marks and Spencers and buy a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> How many times did you barter with people? Oh, various things have bartered. Um, <laughs> wickedly, in the days when one could, um, I did a, a big portrait of a gentleman. For a fur coat. <laughs> <laughs> no string is attached. It's right. Del it, sounds, it sounds dicey, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have that fur coat? Yes. You still have yes, it? Yes, yes. Under wraps, of course, it never sees the light of day. <laughs> Don't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> but then, how did you come into contact with the royals? Um, out of the blue, I just got a, uh, it was just a commission, a straight commission. I couldn't tell you now. Um, I don't remember there being any contact except that I'd been doing portraits. Maybe by that time I belonged to the Portrait Society. I honestly can't remember dates mm. and things. Mm. Um, it was just a commission. Mm. Were you nervous? <laughs> well... I was on the first day, yeah. Um, because um, I was waiting for. I mean, you, you know, the tension of. Um, also, you had an hour per sitting, not two, mm. so you had to be on the ball, and not waste any time at all, because you were only going to get fair enough because they sit all the time. You were only going to get so many sittings of an hour each, it was bluff and catch up time, you know. And um, yes, um, Philip was the first one. And of course, he, he absolutely confounded me by coming through one of those bookcase doors. <laughs> the books uh, suddenly opened and there he was. <laughs> but um, he, was, he was very friendly, mm. yes. Fine. You did, you did painted quite a few of the role. A few of them, yes. Yes, yes I've done... Three of Philip, I think. Five of the Queen. Three of Charles, yes. Three of Charles. Two of Diana. The Queen Mum. When you painted someone several times, does it get easier each time? Um, the personal side, of course, gets easier. Yeah. Um, Everything else is just as it was. You've got exactly the same things to deal with. Mm. You've got a job to do in a certain amount of time. Mm. I I want to move on to the topic of beauty, if that's okay with you. Beauty? Beauty, yeah. Goodness. So um, there's, a, there's a famous quote from Susan Sontag, who's an American essayist of the, say, late 20th century. And um, would you mind if I just read you a quote from do, one of her? Do. It's very short. Um, so here it goes. It's from the essay on photography. So it says, um, So successful has been the camera's role in beautifying the world that photographs or paintings, rather than the world, have become the standard of the beautiful. But first of all... Um, what does beauty mean to you? Long pause. Um, Take your time. 
Oh, that is so multifaceted again. I couldn't pin that down to one thing. I know that... Oh, this gets into something else, talking about photography. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, today, a huge amount of painting, portrait painting, photographs are used. I'm an old-fashioned girl with this is concerned. I ha hate working from photographs. I work from life. I might do a backup of a sleeve fold that won't be there again because I want it. But where the person's concerned, no, I want them. I, w I want the paint to show. Um, if you've got a photograph and you're working from a photograph and doing a beautiful painting from it, you might, as far as I'm concerned, you might as well have the photograph. If it's so good that you do a beautiful painting from it, mm. you might as well have the photograph. I mean, that's, that's a sort of painting technical thing, but beauty, good grief. I mean, the, the leaves on the vine on the front of the house which blew off yesterday, the colors were just gorgeous. That was beauty in the shape. Um, somebody is beauty. Something that they do is beauty. If it's all getting sounding rather pompous. Um, lots of things are beautiful. Photograph in itself, a beautiful photograph in itself can be can be beautiful. Not just pretty, but beautiful. But it's its own thing. Like a leaf is. Mm. When you see something beautiful, how does it make you feel? When you see the vine and its colours? Oh it's what, it's what? joyous. Joyous. It's it, it's it's um It's it's a wash of um, well, it's a sort of emotion goes through you without getting weepy or anything. It's it's um, a sensation. It's a sensation. If you see something beautiful, it soothes. It um, uplifts you, stimulates you. Whatever, depending what it is. Can't go further than that, I think. <laughs> it's all encompassing, the emotion, when you see something beautiful. It takes you over. Um, it affects you, mm. maybe for a split second, but you think, oh, that's nice. Mm. <sighs> it's good for you. It is. Going back to Susan Sontag's quote. Yes. Um photographs have become the standard ah, of yes. beauty. Yes. So in that case, would the same thing in real life not be as beautiful ah, as the um, same thing? I, let's go back to photographs. Photographs have taken over a lot of things, have shaped a lot of things. Mm. Um, because we're so exposed to them all the time. And, of course, they, they cover a lot of forms. Um, it, it's now such a positive element in our life that um, it might be hard to see through photography to painting for a lot of people. They've got the gauze of the f photograph of realist life like things to come down between them and looking looking not just at paintings but at other things don't you agree with that mm -hmm. I mean you're much younger than I am so you've been exposed to them far more even than I have 
except I've had more. <laughs> I've had more years at it. <laughs> yeah. Do you take photographs yourself? Yes, yes. I, that, 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 that is a physical record. Yes. Oh, heavens, yes. I've just cleared up 73 fat volumes of photographs. My third daughter estimated there were 42,000 photographs. Wow. And I went through the lot. And they're now not all over the house, but in plastic bins in my study. Wow. Yes, I take photographs. But it's just, it's, 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 a, it's a diary. It's a diary. Is it uh, a habit for you to take photographs? You, it just happens? And it was. It was, yes. Everybody assumed that uh, I'd be wherever I was with the camera. No, I stopped doing it at a certain point. I haven't done it for ages. Was there a reason why you stopped? Um are something to do with the digital technology mm. and uh, heavens forty two thousand were quite enough. <laughs> 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 I'm glad there weren't more. <laughs> uh what camera did you use, do you remember? Oh just whichever, you know, sure. whichever, yes. <laughs> well of course when we were in Japan on our travels the Japanese kept giving us cameras, so I had an assortment of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite generous. Wonderful cameras. Yeah. Yes. That's very generous. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> um, have you ever had any art students? Did you ever teach art? Yes, but um, very little, very little. Um, uh, really, frankly, I was always too busy to teach what was um, a flat art profession and the four kids mm. yeah um it, it, it that just wasn't on but um latterly um a few years ago now i did some um short weekends at um west dean in near chichester mm. and that that was very pleasant with i suppose a dozen or so students mm. you know just over the weekend, gave them hell, told them I would, yes, that's what I was there for, you know. And, um, but otherwise, very little. Um, I prefer, in a way, not to teach. If people come to me for teaching, it's rather because it's my style, mm. it's something about my work. Hmm. that they want. I don't want them to be like me. I want them to be like themselves. So I tend to say, yes, do come. I've done a lot of this. They come with their work and I give them a criticism. And I hope they go off, you know, with, with something positive. But you don't necessarily teach them your style. You just guide them. Oh, yes. No, you, you know, I, I say, what's your composition? You know, that's the obvious the first thing. And mm. whatever, uh, depending on this, on the on their work, mm. I hope I hope to get them to think for themselves, but not just through my eyes. Mm. Yeah. Who were your mentors in I, art? I, I didn't have any. No, I, I mean this is this is the madness. By the time I went to art school, and like you, I was two years younger than the others, and they put me straight in second year. Um, I had my way of doing portraits, and I c honestly can't remember anybody telling me anything useful. <laughs> Maybe I was young and silly and wasn't listening, but they, they left me to my own devices. I mean, I, obviously, in an art school, and especially a commercial art course, picked up things. But I don't remember tuition. There was a model, there was a life class, get on with it. So I, I, for better and worse, I've gone my own way. Did that instill a sense of confidence in you? Or? I don't think I've thought about it. Um, 
I'm, I'm uh, faced with that. I suppose if you belonged to a school of thought, you would have a certain prop behind you. Um, no, I've just scratched around <laughs> gone my own way. And it seems to have worked. Yeah. And you must get a bit better if you do it so much. <laughs> I mean, you know, most of my life I was working every day. And, of course, certainly overseas as well. You know, I didn't stop. When we were in the Philippines for five years, they um, they had a couple of portrait painters there who did it from photographs, all in their um, native costume and so on. And, of course, I was a bit of a surprise when I said, no, you sit for me and you wear your slacks that you're wearing now. I had the place to myself. I honestly did. There was nobody else doing it. And so, and wonderful characters, different nationalities, which was great because I was with a, an oil company and, um, you know, I was just the wife. And I couldn't do anything too radical as the missus, but I could get away with murder because I was a mad painter. And so I could cross all the social barriers. And um, I ended up with um, leaving there with a two-year waiting list. That's a lot. Yes, because there was nobody else there, you know. And of course... In, in the particular society in which we moved in the, as expats at the time, if one had a portrait, somebody else wanted a portrait. So I was off. Great. And two more kids. <laughs> <laughs> because you worked quite a lot. Yes. Every day. Yes. Was there a point where it just felt like work and it wasn't enjoyable? Oh, look, Anthony, I mean, um, it, it's work. It's work. It's what you must do. Heavens, you know that as yeah. a musician. Um, and also with portraits, somebody's coming in the door at a certain time. No matter what you feel like and what's happening privately, you're on. And you better get it right. Nobody's going to do it for you. You get it wrong, you've got to make up that time. And the mess you've made on the canvas, <laughs> if you do. So you've got to be disciplined. You've got to be disciplined. So of course it's work. But out of that can come satisfaction. And also, I mean, there's the other aspect, the amazing people I've been able to work with. Fascinating people who have enriched my life, and my experience and my horizons just by being with them. I mean, somebody like Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore working with that man. Um, wonderful experience. Uh, apart from the fact that you're in the Astana, you know, the palace and uh, the venues, the venues you've been to. Um, I, I, I just love going around London and, and knowing I've been in that building, mansion house or something. I've slept in the state bed in the mansion house because we had to start at 8.30 in the morning because the, um, the Lord Mayor had other duties. So the only thing to do was have me stay there so we could start early. You know, things like that. Wonderful adventures. Wonderful people with their archbishops of Canterbury who start talking religion slightly with them. All of it slightly because you're working. You, know, you can't get into too serious a conversation. You've got to. But nevertheless, some, some rubs off. Very, very fortunate. Very grateful for so much of it. So painting wasn't just a job, it was a life for you? Yes, yes, um, yes. You know, I can't remember not 
doing it. Well, yes, I can because of this jolly COVID thing. Mm. It was full stop. I couldn't have sitters and I couldn't go to sittings. So I taped the needle point and the jigsaws. Only satisfactory up to a point. <laughs> yeah. But you're working now. So yes. That's good. Back to work. Back, back to work. work. And it feels great. Good. Really does. Da Vinci once said, art um, is never finished, only abandoned. Do you see any of your portraits or any of your works that you could carry on painting? On on those works, you mean? Uh, or see bits that are missing or things that are things you could have done differently? Oh, heavens, yes. yes. I mean... Um, no, you, you've never you've never got it right. Um, I think once every five years I do something that I think that is not bad. <laughs> but nevertheless, there's always something in the painting that you think that's the flaw. It's just you have to know how big the flaw is and whether you can live with it after it's finished. And of course, as a portrait painter, my paintings go off elsewhere. I might never see them again. Um, so you just got to keep the flaws down to bare minimum, <laughs> if you can. <laughs> yes. It's never finished. You, you've, you've, you've never done any art, any art, for heaven's sake. You can always go further, better, of course. It's a lifelong There's journey. There's ten things that you're dealing with. To get all ten dead right? Ah, no way. June, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure, Anthony. Thank you.